Thank you, Jeffrey. I, I am indeed um, a, a, an old person, but it was the 1980s, not the 70s. And, and now, the, the, it's not, I'm not just being pedantic. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that it, uh, it did seem to change police, the film changed police attitudes uh, to, to rape. But then, 20 years later, we made a panorama assessing the change called Rape on Trial, and it was still, there were lots of abuse. There were things, there were sexual offense, uh, uh, sexual assault, uh, ref refuges, I've forgotten what they're called, socks, I think, and uh, in about 15 cities. So that left a lot of other places without it. Um, and it's still, I think, a problem for some of the same reasons why domestic violence uh, is hard to police. And I mean, I, may I just compliment you, Sylvia, on, on a really clear and very lucid uh, discussion of the problems of, of data gathering. But what I want to talk about is the personal side, about why policing individual cases and the police reaction itself is so difficult. Because I started looking at this subject in the mid-80s, so it's nearly 30 years, and I was very shocked by what I found. And with your permission, I'm going to read you just a, a one story, one, office, one woman's story who happens to be a police officer. Very smart, very <coughs> grounded, very the sort of person you would feel could handle whatever was thrown at her in the job, which indeed she said. But she said, there are times here at home when I've actually thought to myself, God, I get called to sort this out, and here I am in my own home and I haven't got a clue what to do. But if you put me in uniform in somebody else's house, I could sort it out in 10 minutes. And he's, she's saying, policemen are no different from other people, although they would like to, we would hope they would be. A lot of them become punchy when they've had a drink. My husband would get drunk, come home and hit me. Then he'd go off to work the next day, and chances are he'd be dealing with domestics. Now, she said, I don't, I didn't, I, I, I asked her, this, we were in Croydon, as a matter of fact, and I remember asking her, do you know anybody else who, um, who any other women who were suffering from this? And she, I mean, in a microsecond, she said, well, I can think of seven off the top of my head. I mean, she didn't have to think at all. There were seven neighbors and friends that had been in the same situation. And one of the, uh, for me, the anomalies about the whole situation is just as you were describing, how many people are involved in this, either as perpetrators or as victims. And we're talking about one in, nearly one in three women, uh, both here and in the United States. Um, and that, that's a huge number of people to be involved in something which would otherwise, if it were burglary or if it were another kind of volume crime, would be a scandal requiring immediate, widespread, kind of epidemiological responses where you'd say this is, has got to be addressed. And yet, in March 2014, out comes the HMIC report, which I think is excellent, but it makes terrible reading. You know, you just want to lose the will to live when you think about how difficult it's been to get people's attention, to do it properly, to take it seriously. And what I want to talk about is why. Why has it been so hard for the police to accept the reality of domestic violence as something they must take more seriously? Now, I'll just tell you, I made a film because of this woman's experience and, and uh, a number of other interviews called Closing Ranks. Did anybody in the room see it? Because it's still used in training. Some of you have. And it's about domestic violence in the police. It was shown on ITV. And what was, I showed it to uh, Peter Imbert, who was also a friend, who was then the commissioner of the Met. And I made sure that I had invited the chaplain of the Met with me. And Peter looked at it and said, this is an outrage. It doesn't happen. You're completely exaggerating it. And I just turned to the chaplain and he said, I'm sorry, Commissioner, it isn't at all exaggerated. Um, I see five couples a week with marital problems and at least one in five has domestic violence in it. And Ian Johnson, who was then his bagman at the time, said, I'm afraid this is something I see all the time. So there's a sense in which it kind of is in the culture, but it's very hard to accept it because nobody really, really, really wants to get involved in private grief. It just feels too difficult. And the reason behind that difficulty, which I think is also very interesting, is because many of the perpetrators think they're right. Now, policing is normally done by consent. And certainly the work I've done with young offenders, I know that there are lots of things like sex crimes and so on, that if you give them a list of what they regard as, as uh, serious and you know, beyond the pale, that's usually it. Elder abuse, they don't approve of that, things like that. So 
then domestic violence comes in in a different way because they will these same guys who have a quite a highly developed moral code it isn't true they're amoral unless they're sociopaths um, but they think that they have a right somehow to knock their women around and this is now again Sylvia you didn't mention it but you will, everyone will know there's an increase between 16 and 24 that the that women at that age between 16 and 24 are actually more likely to be victims than, than later on. But it's also usually the case that domestic violence happens in a longer term relationship. It's not just a sort of one night stand that goes wrong. It's as relationships work, and the evidence on this is really interesting, the seductive nature of people who later turn out to be perpetrators is quite often you know, the thing that gets women into these relationships. And then when they're isolated, then they suddenly start seeing the violence happening. And then that response becomes one that is very confusing because they've had this love, it was in the air, they thought they loved each other. She, um, this woman herself and other women describe how the problem is they do love their perpetrator, the perpetrator. And so that just confuses the question about what to do, should they leave, should they not leave. And when you think about just how complicated it is to enter a world in which the perpetrator themselves thinks it is the other the victim's fault or that they have some justification for punishing the person who they've attacked. Not just responded, they're not just, it's not an accident where they just got drunk and picked up something and hit them. They, they, it, very often they, they will justify what they've done. So the, the notion of the criminal justice system intervening in something where the perpetrator thinks they've done the right thing or has a right to do it at any rate, um, I think is much more complicated than it's a fair cop gov you know, um, I, and proving that people have, have broken the law. Now that problem about consent, I think, is, is wider than just the individual perpetrators. Because I've been an, an advisor on race to the Met and the IAG f since the McPherson report, so that's 14 years. And in the course of that, I've been very aware, along with another uh, member of the IAG, who's a magistrate called Sylvia Maharaj, that in black and ethnic minority communities, there is even more of a cultural acceptance, a sort of default definition that this is normal, that makes it harder for victims to come forward. And then, when they do, as they do very rarely, they're the ones who are shamed. They're very often shunned by their uh, communities and even by their families. They have brought shame onto the family, not the perpetrator, the victim, by involving the justice system. So what we have there is a kind of catch-22. If they do just put up with it, then it'll never change. If they do call the police, they will be in a kind of maelstrom, in a sort of vortex of, of shame and embarrassment and, and uh, further punishment by everybody else, the people they would most likely want to turn to. And there's a case that has always stayed in my memory that um, you may some of you remember anyway, it's quite a long time ago, I think it's about 15 years ago. It's, um, it was in the Orthodox Jewish community in, in I think, Stoke Newington, where two babysitters um, in the Jewish community had abused a boy uh, in a family who had gone out, obviously, in the evening, and somehow they found out about it, and they went to the rabbinical council and said, um, will you handle this? We don't want to go outside and call the police. And the rabbinical council refused to do it, so they did go to the police, and these two uh, babysitters, one I think was about 20 and the other was about 30, uh, were convicted and sent down. At which point, what happened? The family was kicked out of the community for bringing shame onto them. And the rabbinical council said, you should have come to us, right? Catch 22. Now that's the kind of thing, when we were having seminars, as Sylvia and I arranged a series of seminars, and uh, we were lucky enough to have Commander Joe, Christine Jones come to one of them and others who were working um, on domestic violence, and we brought victims along as well, and they found it very helpful to hear first-hand experience of victims, because in a way, uh, no disrespect to you, that when you, you know, aggregate numbers and treat them as trends and this kind of thing, you tend to lose sight of the, of the personal dimension to this. Anyway, we all agreed that the key problem, the key barrier to involving victims in the BME communities was this reluctance of the whole community to judge this as bad, as something wrong, and that needs addressing. So we said, can we get, who are the leaders in BME communities? Well, most of the time it's religious figures. Can you get imams and others to come to these seminars and talk about the problem? And we couldn't get a single one to come, but one of them explained 
to the people who tried to get them that they had tried indeed. They'd gone to the house, this houses of the perpetrators they knew about, and they were thrown out. They said, it's none of your business, and, you know, bugger, bugger <coughs> off, basically. And they did. So instead of preaching, as it were, from the pulpit, which is what we would like them to do, they just shut up about it and accept it. So it seems to me that now you've got fem female genital mutilation, which is its own form of domestic violence, finally being challenged culturally, although there's still lots of it going on and still lots of it being treated as normal. I think what we need is a culture war on domestic violence that actually makes it clear to everyone, including the people who think it's okay and it's normal, that it's not. And as the briefing paper points out, and we all know, of course, this has happened with drink driving and it's now happened with smoking. And I must say, I never thought it would happen with smoking and it's very interesting that it has. But of course, again, neither smoking, you can have, there's, the, the claim was always about driving and so on, the seat belts, I'm old enough to remember the seat belt campaign and the AA saying <laughs> at the time, publishing their annual report with the first line saying, we believe in, and I quote now, in the right to unfettered motoring, right? As though this were a right, you know, I mean, the concept of a right of unfettered motoring. Well, the right to bash your wife um, or your, your partner is, I think, embedded in this problem, that they see it as a right. Now, once you get into that uh, situation, as it were, that conversation is pretty hard because they're so sure of themselves and they're really not listening, they're filtering any argument against it uh, with the, the concept of that right. So then the question becomes, what can we possibly do about this? And there's a woman called Leslie Morgensteiner who's written a book called Crazy Love. Very, I commend it to you. She's also done a TED Talk, brilliant TED Talk, about how she's, by the way, a very well-off middle-class writer, editor. She was married to a hedge fund manager, fell in love with him, completely enchanted by them. He then quit his job, said, we must move to the country, and they lived, uh, they did move to the country. She was astonished. She was willing to give up her own very successful job to do this. And then he started to, to hit her. In fact, when they arrived in this uh, little New England village, he went out and bought three guns, one of which was under the pillow, one of which was in the car, and the other was uh, stayed, uh, stashed somewhere in the house. And he had had, he'd been abused, as the briefing paper wisely points out, that he'd been abused as a child. She thought that this was all because of that, and he said that that was true. And the most interesting thing she says is, that even as she was being beaten twice a week and had a gun pointed to her head quite often, she didn't see herself as a victim. She saw herself as a strong woman dealing with a damaged man and that somehow or other she was not to blame, but she was responsible for sorting it all out. And it, it took two years of that even before, I mean, before she finally realized her life was in danger and that she had to get out. But of course, as we all know, uh, getting out does not end the problem at all. And indeed, in some cases, it increases the risk of homicide. And the American stats are that 70% of domestic homicides happen after the relationship has ended or the man has left because they have nothing to lose. Relationship's over, and they're so angry about it that after stalking, after doing all the kinds of things that we all know about and ignoring non-molestation orders, they kill the, the, their partner. 70% of those murders are, and you did, one thing you didn't talk about is the domestic, the analysis of homicides in terms of domestic, although when you call them serious violence, I'm sure that would be included, said serious violence and murder. But it's very much, I'd like to see those murder figures uh, much taken and spread <coughs> much more widely. And I, as you may have heard me on the Today program and some various other things, talking about crime of one kind or another. And every chance I've had for the last nearly 30 years, I've said, and by the way, the crime we should be talking about is domestic violence because a woman dies every three days. Silence, right? Nobody responds. Nobody knows what to do with this. It's, it is, you know, it goes into the category called too hard. And th th I tried to explain to you what the, uh, as it were, the cultural problems are, but it seems to me there's a deep psychological issue here, and it's empathy, right? The question becomes, how do you generate empathy both for the perpetrator, for what the consequences of what they've done, and for the police officers dealing with it?
And in the HMIC report, there is a remark about a need for greater empathy. And that was certainly true in the handling of rape cases. The, the, the idea of rape victims coming in. I went, one of the things that most shocked me, and it became one of the reasons I became a kind of crusader about rape, is that I was at Hendon doing my research for the Thames Valley series, and I watched a woman sergeant training a, a, a probationer, woman probationer, uh, who was uh, role-playing the victim. And the sergeant was really tough on her and said, and I quote, because again, it's the kind of number that stays in your head, 60% of rape allegations are false. Now, that is a non-number as far as I'm concerned. You know, I mean, it's completely pointless, silly, divisive, undermining number. But where did it come from? And why was it being taught to a young probationer? I never found the answer to that. And they stopped... I think, using that number, and they now say the rape victims must be given the benefit, the allegations of rape must be taken seriously as if they were true and then tested. So this is the kind of problem we're talking about. A lack of empathy, a disbelief, a feeling that it's not worth the time, a pressure that's also the HMIC report speaks about very, very well, a lack of reward inside the police force for doing this kind of work, even though there's excellent work now being done. So there's a kind of cultural barrier inside the police and outside the police in society that makes policing domestic violence really difficult. So then the question becomes, A, how do you generate empathy? And B, what can we do you know, to change the cultural default mode? Well, I know and I've heard very often the critique of restorative justice in its use in respect to this because it feels like a power imbalance that restores power to the perpetrator that the criminal justice system has been trying to diminish. And generally speaking, I can understand that. But I've written a book on restorative justice, and I'm very interested in whether it could be used here. And there's something called the Daybreak Dove Project in Hampshire, in Winchester. When I looked at that, they had something like 90 domestic violence cases on their books. I'd actually seen in Newfoundland, of all places, um, in Canada, a quite successful domestic violence project which was using family group conferencing. So it wasn't just the, the husband and the wife or the perpetrator and the victim. It was the sisters, the uncles, the grandfathers who were all engaged in trying to stop this. I've also seen it in circle sentencing in the Cree community in uh, northern Canada, um, which was where circle sentencing came from. And it's very interesting, that term. The Cree have a... They say that the role of the criminal justice system is to close the circle broken by crime. Beautiful, isn't it? And so then the question becomes, this is a crime, if people understand it to be wrong, right? Because that's almost a definition of crime that has to be accepted. So that's the first problem, is to get people to see it as a crime, and then to accept that they shouldn't have done it and won't do it again. And what circle sentencing does by having, in, in those situations, the whole village sitting there, is saying, if he hits her again, who's going to protect the wife? Who is going to deal with the, the perpetrator? And what, you know, what can be done about it? But if not, then what can he do to make good the harm that he's done to the wife and the family? Now, the question is, could that be applied here? Now, in Washington, DC, they've got a very interesting experiment. That's not an experiment. It's the way they handle it. Not only do they have multi-agency risk assessments, and I'm very, very keen on multi-agency work. I think the police have been handed the most difficult social problems as if you can deal with them, just like social workers. You can't either. It's society. It's got to be health. It's got to be housing. It's got to be all of those things. And in, what they do in Washington is when a call is called to come in and they realize how serious it is, a SWAT team of other agency representatives will go to the house and deal with medical problems, the children, where they go to school, and they've got hotels. They actually keep hotels as temporary refuges. So the problem of closing refuges, as the woman from Solihull didn't yet refer to it, but we know it's true that refuges are being cut slow and, and, and closed down. In Washington, they feel it's a good investment to just try and rescue the whole family from a crisis situation and deal with it as a multifaceted crisis, not just a criminal justice crisis. And the longer term implications of somebody, of a woman leaving her house, taking her children out away, and then the stalking and revenge and threats if the criminal justice system is being used, makes the whole thing just a hornet's nest of emotional trauma 
and for the children. And one of the notes in the briefing uh, uh, document said, talks about the damage to the children and the likelihood of um, <coughs> those children even becoming abusers themselves because, of course, it's no normalized by them watching. They think that's what parental life is like, that abuse is part of it. But Harvard has just done some work which I find very interesting. And I was on the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Commission for three years and looked at a study that talked about um, the, it, it, was a, it was actually a mouse study, if you like, that mice giving, having traumatic pregnancies and traumatic births gave birth to, um, to little to mice that had, <laughs> that had fewer synapses in the brain because the excess of cortisol caused by the stress damaged their brains even as they were being born. So they were already behind the eight ball, so to speak. They didn't, you know, they had less chance to deal with stress because of the damage stress it was causing in the womb and, and in the birth. And the Harvard study has now looked at the children of, in domestic violence homes and their brain development and said, yes, it's damaging their brain development. So it's not just in the birth and the pregnancy, it continues. So there is a medical prediction of more trouble with the children. So it is child abuse as well as marital abuse. Now, picking up what Sylvia was talking about, kind of consistent typology, there's a professor, Michael Johnson, some of you may know from uh, he's an assistant professor at, at the University of Michigan, and he's divided up uh, topology in an interesting way, and I, you may well know about it and not, not use it, but I thought it was interesting, because he's saying part of the problem in understanding domestic violence is that there are different types of it, and if we are going to keep data, it's worth having that distinguished. And it isn't just seriousness and less serious. It's what the first kind, which is coercion and control and physical, is what he calls intimate terrorism. A wonderful, vivid term, which I think begins to speak to the personal, emotional scale of, of what it feels like. Domestic, intimate terrorism. Then the second one is really interesting and very difficult. It's called situational couple abuse. And that's in which both parties are party to what psychologists call a bad contract. Right? They feed each other, they provoke each other, they get off on each other. Uh, and so that there is a sense in which both parties are abusing each other. That tends to be less physically violent, but you can imagine, you know, think of uh, that wonderful play, Who, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, and the way that couple uh, talks to each other, that kind of thing. And then the third is um, victim violence, where the victim does fight back, but violently. And we all remember the case in the high, the world, the high court, where the woman finally, you know, first she was condemned for having stabbed her husband uh, by going next door to get the knife after he was going to hit her for the umpteenth time. And finally, I believe she got off. It was accepted that that was provocation. But it was regarded as uh, premeditated because she was able to go from being beaten up to the next room to get a knife and, and stab him. Now, that's the kind of distance to me as, a, and as an observer of this and a storyteller, if you like, that I think we have a problem about that the criminal justice system, I, we did, Nick Ross and I did a series you might have seen called The Truth About Crime three years ago on BBC One, where we took two weeks in Oxford and just tried to see how much harm was happening to the people of Oxford and then what the criminal justice system did to it. And one of the women who ran the refuge in Oxford said, we find women time and time again unwilling to go to court because when they get to court, they're asked a question like, did he hit you on the left cheek or the right cheek? And it's one incident out of a pattern of violence that you were talking about that is being prosecuted. And if they can't remember, because it was a while back and it happened so often, that case may be weakened or even thrown out. So that that need, as it were, to prove the details, the forensic detail of what is actually a pattern of violence and coercion and, and, and well, abuse, um, doesn't sit well. And we know rape victims are very reluctant to come forward because they'll think they'll be abused all over again in court, having personal details accused. And the shame that so many victims feel that they have found themselves in this situation is the final, to me, the barrier for the criminal justice system. So then, finally, the, I wind up here with the question, of, is there anything we can do? Well, the empathy training comes from, to me, at some kind of listening to the victims, whether it's in an RJ situation, a wider one than just the two, uh, or, or just simply watching films like, like ours and trying to get people to understand the human side of this, not just the legal side, the human side. And finally, this woman, Leslie Morgan Seiner, makes the case, and so does the YouGov, matches the YouGov poll, that 
I think it's nearly 45% of the people asked would support a wider discussion of this, a mu much more information about you know, the kind of things that Sylvia was talking about, just the, the prevalence of this, the normality of it, that people, victims should talk to not only friends and neighbors and family, but as, as the woman Steiner did, even to strangers, just as a way of saying, is it happening to you? And if it's one in three women, it certainly is. Thank you very much.